Peace. Are you looking for a way to teach your kids about money management and responsibility? Look no further than the green light card. The green light card is a debit card for kids that parents can manage through an app, giving you complete control over where and how much your child spends. With the green light card, you can start teaching your kids valuable financial lessons while earning rewards at the same time. For more information about Greenlight and to get started, please click the link in the show notes below. Thank you. That's a job, you know, that's a job that somebody can do. So it's expected. I actually have the um, the actual numbers here. Um, by the year 2030, automation and um, artificial intelligence has the potential to eliminate 73 million jobs. So think wow. about that. 73 million jobs globally by the year 2030. That's 46% of the current jobs will be eliminated. Now, there, there's, there's a plan to create jobs as well. So it's not bad. There's a plan to create jobs, but there's still going to be a deficit of about 15 million jobs. So wow. what people need to think about at this time is how do you reskill for the future? How do you re-educate yourself for the future? And we need to look at where we're going and understand the market is going to look completely different and start looking at jobs in those categories and careers in those categories. Belief's first job podcast here to answer any questions that y'all ask. Financial literacy and resources, parents and young people becoming bosses, CEOs, future leaders, entrepreneurs, conferences and boardrooms getting sponsors secured. If you want generational wealth, Brooklyn's own Curran Phillip with information to help. Malik's first job podcast. Malik, Malik podcast. Brooklyn's own Curran Phillip. Curran, Curran Phillip. Malik's first job podcast. Podcast. Pod podcast. Brooklyn's own Curran Phillip. Generation wealth. wealth. Greetings, everyone. How you doing? Welcome to another episode of the Malik's first job podcast where we discuss leadership, entrepreneurship, and financial literacy for parents and teens. Uh, today, we have a great guest, Ms. Delinda Russell of Monarch Business Services, LLC. Now, Delinda is a community activist, small business mentor, and a financial literacy advocate. So I'm going to head and pass it off to Delinda. How are you doing this morning? Or this uh, this afternoon, actually. I'm yeah. good. How about you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for taking the time to uh, to come onto the podcast. Now, for those that aren't familiar with you, can you please you know tell them more about yourself? Okay. Well, you started with the basic. My name is Delinda Russell. Um, I'm actually a native of Michigan, but I am a transplant of Texas. I've been in Texas for about ten years now. Um, I consider myself to be an advocate for financial literacy because my background is actually in banking. I did banking for about 17 years. Um, and that's really kind of how I ended up where I am today because one day I woke up and I realized that everything I had been taught through my years of experience was different and I didn't believe in it anymore. So I kind of embarked on a journey to kind of self-educate myself and to learn um, the importance of financial ed education, literacy, how to invest, how to save, um, how to build for the future all by myself. So, okay. yes. Okay. So I guess after 17 years is when you jumped, you launched into the uh, Monarch Business Services? Yes, yes. And you know, I actually have an interesting story about that because in 2018, I had my first child. And like I said, I was in the banking industry for 17, 18 years and I was on maternity leave. And my job nice. had an awesome maternity leave. I was on maternity leave for, I believe, maybe four or five months. And at the end of my maternity leave, I got a, um, a call from my boss and he basically said that my position had been eliminated. So I had wow. two more weeks left of maternity leave and they called me and said my position had been eliminated. So um, at that moment, I was a little scared but mm -hmm. they offered me a severance package so you know severance packages can usually be pretty good so i had some money to, to do um or to take care of myself financially 
And of right. course, I'm married and, you know, I have a husband, so we, I do have a two income household, you know, fortunate enough to have that. But in that moment, I said to myself, how heartless could a company be to have a woman on my chart? Like, you don't know my financial situation at home. And to call me mm -hmm. with two weeks left, and you know, if you, well, women know, like, after you have a child, there's so many emotions that you go through and that you experience that mm -hmm. I felt like I don't want to put myself in that situation again. And so right. I sat out on this journey to better myself um, and just to start my own business, to discover my true passion, discover what it was that I was really interested in. Because when you work for a company for so long and in the same industry, you become a product of that industry. Like they indoctrinate you, they make you who they want you to be, you know? And that was part of me waking up and saying, like, I'm a product of the industry that I've been working in. I've been taught to do things this way for so long. And it was eye opening to kind of understand that the things that I had been taught were necessarily mm -hmm. not the best things. So right. that's my interesting story of how I became or came to where I am today as an entrepreneur. And I do um, what I do for a time. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. So, um, now I think I, I came across you because I know like after I wrote my first book, you know, the Malik's first job, um, somehow, you know, you know, I guess the algorithms or I don't know even how, how I came across mm -hmm. it's the financially conscious Facebook group. Yes. Right. Yeah. Now, how long ago did now that's a group that you started? Correct? It is. Yes. Right. So, so it's, a about group, that. it's a group that I started with five friends of mine that all work in the banking industry. We all had different experiences in different parts of banking. I had a, um, a lady that was a, a underwriter, a mortgage specialist, another um, gentleman who was um, in the mortgage industry, and you know a couple of other people that worked in different departments in the banking industry. And mm -hmm. the goal of it was we created the group after um, the George Floyd incident. And the whole purpose of it was to kind of educate, to make it a platform that people who had information or knowledge would kind of be willing to go on and just to kind of share um, what they do or, you know, secrets or tips, um, best practices on how they save, how they invest, how they make money. And that's right. really how it started. It started as a group um, for African-American people just to kind of share because I noticed that there's always a lag when it comes to the information that we have. And um, as it relates to investing, I, me personally, I always felt like I was always just a little late, you know? Like, mm -hmm. oh, if I would have invested, you know, two years ago in this, I would have this right about now. So we created it as a platform so people could kind of share information um, that they had to better the community. Yes, yes, like I said, within the group, there's so many, so much information being shared you know, that's, that's vital for us to know, you know, and it kind of makes me think about like all the stuff that's going on today, you know, with the um, topics about the dollar, about mm -hmm. the US dollar, and how the different comp different, not, not companies, different countries are dropping the dollar. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yes. Um, the word that they have for it is de-dollarization. And um, basically what that means is that investors are considering other options to invest in like for so long countries have invested in the u.s because they've seen the dollar as a safe investment like you can mm -hmm. count on the u.s dollar to do what it's going to do but I i'm going to take it back as far as 2008 when we had the um, financial crisis of 2008 um, mm -hmm. there was a lot of things that kind of transpired that shook the market and then fast forward to this war with um, Russia and Ukraine, the fact that we placed a huge penalty on Russia's assets with the U.S. kind of was eye opening to other countries like China, um, where they basically said, well, if I have a certain amount inside of U.S. dollars in the reserve, they can do the same thing to me, too, because I believe we placed a hold on over six hundred billion dollars of Russian assets and U.S. Wow. dollars. And we basically mm -hmm. said, because you're doing this, we're going to hold this money. And it impacted Russia's economy to where their um, their currency was like 
temporarily, um, I'm trying to think of the best word for it. I can't think of a word right now, but their 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 mm -hmm. currency was yeah yeah their currency typically temporarily collapsed. That's the best way to put it. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where people weren't able to get money out of the bank, the financial institutions were down. They limited how much money you could take out in the day. It was so much that kind of happened with that. So as a result of the U.S. doing that, and that's not the first time that the U.S. has done that, um, has okay. weaponized the U.S. dollar. Other countries are now considering investing in other assets and um, de -dollar de -dollar de -dollar <laughs> I'm talking too fast here. Um, right. De dollarizing their assets. So basically, it's them diversifying um, the money that they have and saying that the US might not be the best option to invest in. Maybe we need to look over here in China, or maybe we need to look in Japan, or maybe we need to look in Brazil. That's basically what's happening. Okay. Okay. And then when we see this whole, I guess the um, the different country, the countries coming together, mm -hmm. Brazil, Russia, um, mm -hmm. to China, India, and South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, can you, for those that aren't familiar, you know, sometimes you know we don't pay attention mm -hmm. to the financial news. We like we know what's going on with the Kardashians yeah. and all this other stuff. But when it comes <laughs> to you know, when it comes to financial topics and world, you know, world things happening. We, we don't really pay attention to that. So can you please kind of talk to a little bit about the whole BRICS? Yes. You know. Okay, so there's been alliances amongst countries for forever. Um, the BRICS, they've been, I want to say maybe 15, maybe even 20 years, they've always had this type of alliance. So the BRICS is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And right. um, there has been recent talks about them using other um another form of currency, either using a form of currency or creating another form of currency to do trading. And right. why this is important is because the U.S. dollar is the Federal Reserve currency, which means that pretty much our international trade, at least 90 percent of international trade goes through the U.S. dollar. So that means that um, if I purchase oil from Saudi Arabia, I have to go and get U.S. dollars to purchase that oil from Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm which keeps the U.S. economy going. So if I no longer have to purchase the U.S. dollar to um, transact, to purchase oil or anything internationally, then that means that there's less dollars um, being used. So right. this is what these other nations, other nations are considering. They, they're considering using a different form, form of currency or um, creating a form of currency to be used amongst themselves to trade which could lead to fragmentation of the U.S. economy. It can, it can lead to um, the end of the U.S. as the reserve currency. Like there's so many different avenues that it could go down. Right, right. So hearing stuff like that, it, it can be somewhat scary. Just know that, you know, it's the way it may impact our economy, mm -hmm. things going on overseas. So what is something that, I, or things that we can do here in the, in the States to kind of, protect ourselves, even prepare ourselves for what's to come or what's coming or what's already here. Yeah, so let me start by saying I'm not a financial advisor, but okay. um, one thing that, so I'll share with you what I do. Um, mm -hmm. Gold is always a safe bet. Purchasing gold is always a safe bet. So um, when I say purchasing gold, I mean actual physical gold bars. There's websites right. out there where you can purchase gold bars and you can hold those because gold typically holds its value. It's a great store of value. Um, mm -hmm. So saving money in gold, um, having um, cash on hand, because as I mentioned, my background is in banking. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't know if you paid attention to the recent collapse of Silicon Valley Bank in right. um, California, um, when stuff like that starts to happen, it's usually a snowball effect. Like there's gonna be other incidents of this kind of happening and popping up. And there has been smaller cases. There's been maybe three other banks that are experiencing some difficulties similar to SVB Bank. Um, and right. there's other banks that probably have issues too that we don't know about. So right. as it relates to that is making sure that you have cash, on hand at home mm -hmm. because if something happens people are going to rush to the banks to get as much money as they can get out people are going to be transferring online money out of their accounts 
they're going to be at the bank and banks can tell you that they don't have your money you know so that's what happened with silicon valley bank like people went and they said hey we don't have any money to give you just because you deposit the money in the bank doesn't mean that it's actually there they loan it out and they um they invested in other places so making sure that you do have money available at home you know a couple of thousand if you can spare a couple of hundred whatever it is you know get it put it in a safe put it in a safe place so if something does happen you have it um right. yeah so I, I mentioned gold is always a safe right. bet it's a great store of value having um cash on hand um just in case if something does happen um and my third one is a little bit riskier it's way more riskier but okay. i'm betting on bitcoin and okay. that's just that's just that Bitcoin, okay. I think, is going to be a great store of value. Okay, and we've seen recently, I guess, um, kind of really, I haven't paid attention to it like in the last couple of weeks, but the, I know the uh, the price of Bitcoin went down over a period of time, and people were taking their money out of it, uh -huh. right? You know, do you know? I guess um, what caused the decline in Bitcoin? Because you know, at one time it was like the hottest thing that was out. Uh -huh. You know, everybody was talking about it, but then after a while, people started to back off a little bit. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency and it's a highly speculatory asset. So it, I think the mm -hmm. highest it went was maybe about 70, 69,000. And right. then it dropped down to about 18, 17,000 dollars. And now it's back at 30. Um, mm -hmm. So it, you see it fluctuating. But I think, right. um, in my opinion, um, mm -hmm. The reason why Bitcoin went so high was because of all of the money that was circulating in the economy due to the pandemic. Everybody had extra money. Everybody was investing. People were investing in the stock market. That's why the stock market went so high and people were investing in Bitcoin too. And so as mm -hmm. a result of all that extra money, people started putting their money in Bitcoin um and the price of bitcoin went really high it was the, the cryptocurrency market in general was over inflated and then as things started to kind of transpire like money started getting tight you know people started taking out you know money and as a result it just kind of went back down it's just it's in my opinion that the explanation is just that simple like people started started pulling their money out and right. I don't think it was because of anything like people don't believe in Bitcoin. I just think people started taking their earnings because they believed that it was at the height. So the people who invested at the bottom started taking their mm -hmm. earnings out because they wanted to maximize and capitalize on their investment. And the people who kind of bought it in late, you know, they felt like they were losing their money and they started taking their mm -hmm. money out. And as a result, it just kind of bottomed out. But yeah. you see it is moving back up. Yeah. Today is a great day to start your own podcast. Whether you're looking for a new marketing channel, have a message you want to share with the world, or just think it would be fun to have your own talk show. Podcasting is an easy, inexpensive, and fun way to expand your reach online. Buzzsprout is hands down the easiest and best way to launch, promote, and track your podcast. Your show can be online and listed in all the major podcast directories, like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google products and more within minutes of finishing your recording. Podcasting isn't hard when you have the right partners and the team at Buzzsprout is passionate about helping you succeed. Join over 100,000 podcasters already using Buzzsprout to get their message out to the world. Let's create something together. Follow the link in the show notes and let Buzzsprout know that we sent you and that will get you a $20 Amazon gift card if you sign up for a paid plan and help support our show. Thank you very much. And let's be great podcasting together. Peace. Malik's first job, Financial Principles for Teens, is an excellent resource to get your children started on understanding the basics of financial literacy. This book, which is set in Brownville, Brooklyn, about a young man who gets his first job and then shortly thereafter sits down with his dad to learn how to manage his money. There are several topics that are covered within this work, uh, such as paying yourself first, disciplining your spending, knowing the difference between an asset and a liability, creating multiple sources of income, 
as well as the importance of being charitable. So again, if you want to get your children started on understanding finance and becoming responsible adults, we highly recommend that you purchase the book, Malik's First Job, Financial Principles for Teens. So please visit maliksfirstjob.com to get more information. Peace. Yeah, yeah. Now, you know, you mentioned the, the pandemic, and I know uh-huh. that the, the pandemic itself had a major impact on different industries, you know, across, across the world, uh-huh. you know. Uh, we see, like, you know, the financial markets, the job market it impacted, uh-huh. and we're seeing a lot of changes as a result of that, right? Um, you know, I see, you, like, you do your videos on Instagram and TikTok all the time, and, you, you know, you, you highlight certain things. And one of the things that you spoke about recently was the um, the rise of artificial intelligence and automation, right? Mm-hmm. And I know that um, that came out of you know because of course you know during the pandemic you know people lost mm-hmm. their jobs, and then mm-hmm. as things started to ease up, people stopped returning to work, right? Yeah. Like there's a huge staffing shortage, shortage. Even now, as you go around, you still see help wanted signs at different places. Mm-hmm. So now a lot of some companies are turning to automation to replace those workers uh-huh. right that that haven't come back to the to the workforce now uh-huh. um i know you're in texas correct yeah mm-hmm. and i think um one of the uh restaurants that uh incorporated automation was mcdonald's uh-huh. and i think you're not too far from the mcdonald's yeah I'm not. in texas that has the uh-huh. automation can you kind of speak to uh-huh. you know um that actual location yeah, so I was expected because there was a lot of coverage on this location, uh, and they talked about it being fully a fully automated McDonald's. So when I mm-hmm. when I went, I was expecting not to see many workers. Just kind of, I was expecting to see maybe a kiosk because pretty much all the McDonald's now have a kiosk that you can kind of order from with the online application. And I I expected to maybe see like some robots in the back of this McDonald's. But it was yeah. different. Um, there was okay. no lobby, no McDonald's Playland, um, very small lobby, um, like four kiosks on the inside. And there was a um, to go door. So like for Uber Eats and, you know, people who are picking up their orders from the application, there's a door on the side. And there was about seven employees actually in the back preparing the food, but the drive through was set up differently. So there was a regular drive through lane, and then there was a um, lane for people who placed advance orders through the application. And that lane was fully automated. It was a, um, a conveyor belt that actually circled your food through the system and mm-hmm. kind of pushed it out to you. So that was the biggest difference was just the, the drive through Now, I, like I said, I expected to see it being robots on the inside of this McDonald's, but it wasn't. But that's not to say that in the future, that is not their plan. Because from what I understand, when they first opened, it was less employees, but people started, um, um, I guess, not showing up at this McDonald's because they knew that they were planning to make it 100% automated. And so they fully stacked it. So I think ultimately the plan is to make it one of those locations where there's very limited workers, but because of where we are, I guess in this certain city, you know, as it comes to the acceptance of something being fully automated, people kind of started um, pulling back from the location. And so as a result, they put more people there. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with this whole, I guess, rise in automation and things of that sort, what type of impact is that going to is that going to have on the um, on the job market, you know, and people like like what kind of you know careers can people look forward to in the future? And what, like, how can they prepare for that? This automation and AI is going to have a huge impact to our job market, and um, we can see it now. Um, the other day, a friend of mine sent me a video. They were inside of Sam's Club, and Sam had a um, a floor sweeper service like a, a machine I was just going through and just sweeping the floor and waxing and mopping the floor. Now, nice. um, that's a job, you know, that's a job that mm-hmm. somebody can do. So it's expected, I actually have the um, re- the actual numbers here. Um, by the year 2030, automation and um, artificial intelligence 
has the potential to eliminate 73 million jobs. So wow. think about that, 73 million jobs globally by the year 2030. That's 46% of the current jobs will be eliminated. Now, there, there, there's a plan to create jobs as well, so it's not bad. There's a plan to create jobs, but there's still going to be a deficit of about 15 million jobs. So what people need to think about at this time is how do you reskill for the future? How do you re-educate yourself for the future? And we need to look at where we're going and understand the market is going to look completely different and start looking at jobs in those categories and careers in those categories. And those categories are um, things that are innovative, like technology. Um, Facebook has a certification. They have a program that you can go through and you can get all types of different certifications as it relates to like technology and things like that. Those programs are gonna be beneficial. Um, physics, chemistry, biology, engineering, um, anything that is green. Um, green jobs, like sustainable energy jobs, like that's where the future is going. Like we're going to a more sustainable future. So you have to look at jobs that are being created just by that whole move, um, the whole movement of sustainable energy. So those are the things that um, I encourage people to look at as it relates to careers of the future, just kind of thinking about where we're going. And you want to specialize as much as you can, like specialize in a career field. Um, those general jobs, like getting a degree in something very general, that was really not going to be beneficial going forward. And um, when I talk about um, artificial intelligence and automation eliminating jobs, I'm talking primarily lower skill jobs, like the jobs right. that don't require like degrees, like janitors, laborers, the construction, you know, construction field, like people who work in those industries need to consider um, reskilling or upskilling, you know, just to kind of make themselves competitive as we progress. Right. Right. You know, as, as you're explaining this, I'm thinking about like getting the, those low skill jobs and those people that live in those low income communities that it was easy for them to go to like a McDonald's or, mm -hmm. you know, um, a Lowe's and just get that entry level position and just, you know, be a cashier or just, you know, be a janitor and stuff like that. And, you know, you speak about upskilling and um, getting different uh, uh, focus and degrees. Now, I'm thinking, I guess, do these people in these low income communities have the resources to get that information they're going to need to be skilled for the jobs of the future and how they can go about doing so? Mm -hmm. Well, OK, so I didn't get a chance to explain to you what Monarch Business Services was at the beginning of our meeting. And, mm -hmm. and basically what I do personally is I help individuals, um, individuals with disabilities find job placements. Um, and I have a contract with the state of Texas and I do that. So by doing that, I know that there's resources and it's really up to the individuals now. Like there's resources that your states offer to reskill and to upskill. And then even mm -hmm. small business owners, or owners, there's um, grants and services that they offer small businesses where you can send your employees to these institutions for free. Um, to get them those types of skills. So you have to be resourceful. Like nobody is going to roll it out to people in certain areas. Like we have to go in those areas and really explain what's happening. Hey, I understand you've been doing X, Y, Z for so long, but like it's time to start preparing for the future. And these are some things that you should consider, you know, doing. And a lot of the things, um, a lot of the jobs of the future, they're certifications. So um, there, there are small certifications that people can get. It's not like a four-year or two-year type of degree. You can go to school. Right. Like I said, Meta has uh, has a program, you know, and it's, I'm not going to say it's not that much because you, I don't want to count anybody's pocket, but it's, you know, $2,000 that, you know, maybe you can use your income tax check for it. You can figure out a way to kind of pay it. Like there's all types of different payment alternatives that you can use it. Um, even when working at certain jobs, your jobs may have where they pay for tuition, like tuition reimbursement. I know I worked at um, Home Depot mm -hmm. back in the day, and if you were there for six months, you know, you got tuition reimbursement. So just consider those type of options for your job. I know Burger King has it and McDonald's has it too. Um, it's just a matter mm -hmm. of what programs they're willing to pay for it. 
but just yes. making sure that we're resourceful and that we um we're looking for alternative ways to pay for these things and that we educate that we ourselves educate and, ourselves and educate, our educate our children um yeah. so that they understand that when they're going to school they need to specialize in you know because when i was in school it was like oh make something broad and you can just do about anything you know that was my thought when i was in college um but nowadays you need to you really need to hone in on your skill and specialize whether it's entrepreneurship um or whether it's a, a degree or a certification that you're trying to obtain you need to be specific as possible right right and i think i think i did a post like a few weeks ago or last week where you know when i was speaking about earlier those people that are from those low income area low skill areas is that you know i guess at some point you may find yourself with your back against the wall and you have no other choice but to you know make an excuse or make it happen you know um there's there's so many resources that are out here um people who utilize youtube university to educate Absolutely. themselves mm -hmm. you know um you have skillshare and i think if like certain libraries if you have an account you can get free access to a lot of these online uh, okay. platforms so i guess there is you know if, if you're focused and, and willing enough to get something done you'll find a way to get it done and to get mm -hmm. the, the skills that you need um now what are your thoughts on people that say that um college degrees are no longer needed in in the world that we're, we're about to jump into oh you put you put my back up against the wall in this <laughs> <laughs> okay so um let me preface this by saying that i am a reader and and in the financially um conscious Facebook group, I have a book club and we read all types of different books. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the rabbit holes that I jumped in last year was the World Economic Forum. Are you familiar with them? The World yeah. Economic Forum? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and just this whole plan of globalizing things. And one of the things that they, they talk about, um, a topic of discussion is particularly not degrees, but just a certification and lifelong learning. So people get in these positions and just the continuous learning on the job, which in my opinion kind of um, takes away from the degree part is basically saying we'll train you and we'll keep training you, we'll keep training you so you'll get a job and you'll kind of stay in that field and we'll, we'll go. So based off of just the rabbit holes that I jumped in, and I'm not saying it's going to be tomorrow or in five years or 10 years, but I... I, I firmly think that certifications and um, job skills training on a job is going to be more of where um, we go in the future um, right. and more international learning and things of that nature. That's where I right. see it going. But if I had a magic yes. ball, I'd be a millionaire right now. But <laughs> Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the hands-on experience is more, you know, I guess you get more out of it than just you know reading a textbook mm -hmm. you know i always use the example that you know i could sit here and read a book about riding a bike you know but it's not until i get on top of that bike and start pedaling yeah. is when i really start to figure things out mm -hmm. you know yeah. so so yeah yeah but you know that that's you know people have different opinions on that you know as far as mm -hmm. the uh college degree no college degree you know so i just wanted to get your thoughts on that and I think honestly too, like with the whole push towards globalism, um, mm -hmm. the certifications and things will kind of level the playing field um, as it as it relates to the competitiveness of like the job market. Because it wouldn't right. say that if you got your degree from a certain part of the world that is better than a degree in another part of the world. So with the doors opening and people becoming more mobile as it relates to like employment. Um, they have yeah. to level the playing field somewhere. And I think that's where um, in the future they will level the playing field. It's basically going to be um, a skill set. Right, right, definitely. That's my opinion. Yeah, right, right, right. So I just heard you mention that, um, you know, part of, your, part of the financially conscious group is there's a book club, right? Yes. What are three books that you recommend um people read to become more financially conscious mm. 
I actually have three books right here. Um, <laughs> well, um, but they're not. Okay, so I like Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I think that's the number one um, book that um, mm -hmm. I would say read. Um, Think and Grow Rich is another one um, by right. Napoleon Hill because it really focuses on your mindset. And actually, that was one of the first books that we read. Um, and in my opinion, it should be like one of the first books that anybody else reads because it says that if your mind is not right, if you're not there mentally, if you can't really visualize it, if you don't know where you're going, then it, you know, it, it will impact you. So it's about getting your mind right first. So Think and Grow yeah. Rich, um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, and I'm trying to think of a third one. Um... I really don't have a third one. Those are my those are my okay. top two. Um, but okay. I do have a um a book. This book right here, um, that I do have right here on my desk is the Change Your World Order. It's uh you probably can't see it because it's um facing backwards, but to me, um this book has been probably one of the most useful books that I've read in a long time. Um, so it's okay. the Change of World Order by Ray Dalio. And it okay. just kind of breaks down um, why nations succeed and why nations fail. So for me, okay. because I, I like to look at things at a bigger level, it, it, right. I was able to break it down and say, okay, this is how I'm going to prepare myself um, financially for what may happen, even though it may right. not happen, but this is what I'm going to do. Right, right. I know recently in a post you mentioned that book, and there was two others as well. And I, I think, I and I think that, like, like those books help people to understand what's going on right now. So yes. can you mention the other two books as well? Yes. Yeah, so I have The Great Reset, um, COVID-19, The Great Reset. And then the third one is The Fourth Industrial Revolution. This one is a very, very good book. Um, so when I talk about automation and I talk about AI, um, this book was written in 2017. Um, 2016, 2017, and they talk about pretty much all the stuff that we see going on right now, like AI, um, automation, the change in the job market, um, and pretty much everything, like the, the U.S. dollar, the relations that we have going on, like this fourth industrial revolution and the COVID-19 book, they both cover it. And what's unique about the fourth industrial revolution book um, is that in the back of it, it talks about tipping points. And it says by 2025, we expect to have so many people using this type of technology. And they break it down by the technology. Like they say, okay, by 2025, we expect to have 90% um, of the world using cell phones. Um, by 2025, we expect to have 85% um, of the workforce using artificial intelligence in some form. Like they break it down in here. Um, so I, I thought this book was really unique um just because you know we've had the first industrial the second the third and now the fourth industrial revolution which is the implementation of artificial intelligence and automation um yes. and nobody's really talking about it so that's what we're seeing we're in this like unique period and this unique time that we're living through and it's happening right. and we think it's happening slow but it's actually really happening fast and right. we're not going to be able to recognize it until we look back, you know, 20 years from now. I'm like, wow, like we lived through the fourth industrial revolution. So yeah. um, that's a really unique book. And then the COVID-19 book is really unique to me because it was written during the pandemic. Like six months into the pandemic, they had all okay. of the information inside of this book and they put it out and published it. And it's pretty accurate. So it just says to me that, you know, things are somewhat planned, you know. They know what's mm -hmm. going to happen, you know, based off of how, you know, they observe us and, you know, right. information like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for people that are interested in, in reaching out to you and, you know, learning more about you, where can they find you online? Um, you can find me on Facebook under my name, Delinda Russell. Um, you can also find me inside of the Facebook group, Financially Conscious. I'm on Instagram, um, Delinda Russell. Um, the same thing with TikTok, Belinda Russell, um, mm -hmm. and that's pretty much it. And I do respond to inboxes and all that other stuff too. Okay, great, great. So any, anything that you want to share before we wrap up today? 
Um, I want to thank you for this uh, great opportunity and this lovely conversation. Um, the, the one thing that I would like to share with this everyone is that um, make sure that we are conscious of what's going on, not, not just focusing on what's right in front of us. Make sure that we just take a holistic look at everything that's going on and make the decisions um, of the future based off what's best for us and our families. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Amen. All right. So thank you all. Thank you, Delinda, again for, for joining us today. And thank everyone for watching. And we will see you all next week. Peace. Thank you. Generation, Generation wealth, 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 wealth.